You're listening to the Limitless Leaders podcast series brought to you by ASPS, the Aesthetic Society, and the American Hernia Society with the generous support of Allergan Aesthetics. I'm Dr. Ashley Amalfi. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon at the Quotella Center for Plastic Surgery in Rochester, New York, and I'm the vice chair of the ASPS Women's Plastic Surgeons Forum and also a member of the Limitless Leaders Steering Committee. I invite you to check out Season 1 of the Limitless Leaders Podcast, where we share real-life stories of women in our field who are tackling gender-related issues, large and small. The topics we cover are as diverse as the women we will be speaking to. I hope you enjoy this listening experience. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 1 of the Allergan Limitless Women's Leadership Podcast Series. We're grateful to Allergan for their unwavering support of this important initiative. This podcast series is dedicated to providing you with real life stories of women in surgery who are tackling gender related hurdles, large and small. The stories and topics covered will be as diverse as this group of women that we represent. My name is Susan McLennan and I'm a board certified plastic surgeon in private practice at Mountain Lake Plastic Surgery in Burlington, Vermont. The theme of this first season is finding personal balance. Balance can be such a tricky word because we're never truly balanced. I've heard it said that you can have it all, but just not at the same time. It's more of a give and take between the demands of our careers as surgeons, our roles as mothers, and the fulfillment we need in our personal lives. How do we grow our careers and our families at the same time? How do we find balance that's not necessarily perfection, but that is sustainable and fulfilling? That's what we'll talk about today. My guests today are Dr. Carrie Campbell, a plastic surgeon in group private practice in Memphis, Tennessee. Hi, Susan. Thanks so much for having me. And Dr. Abby Chaffin, who's an associate professor of plastic surgery in academic practice at Tulane in New Orleans. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Susan. I'm excited to be here. And also from New Orleans, Dr. Summer Black, who's an experienced board certified plastic surgeon in private practice. Hi, Thanks for having me. So growing a career and a family, what a challenge. Um, You know, I spent 15 years in academic employed practice and had my two daughters while I was working full time and taking Q3 call at a level one trauma center. And my parents live about 12 hours away. So we were really never able to rely on them for as family backup. And by the time my older daughter was one, we realized that we were paying our nanny pretty much as much as my husband was bringing in from his career in the outdoor industry. So once we made that realization, he quit working to stay home with her when she was about one year old. He remained the at-home parent for about 13 years and now works part-time, but still does a lot of the at-home stuff. So although that had its pros and cons, it was certainly the right answer for us for a very long time. I will say that it was a lot of pressure on me to be the sole breadwinner, especially when my group began to deteriorate and I was considering leaving my employed position to open a solo practice. And I, you know, I probably stayed in the employed position way too long because of my need to provide for my family. So I did eventually leave the employed academic practice to go solo and I'm even busier now, but it's really the happiest I've been in my career. So in summary, I'm the sole breadwinner with a stay-at-home dad husband most of the time, no family nearby, two two daughters now ages 13 and 16, 21 years in practice, and still hanging on and making it work most of the time. So Dr. Campbell, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your family structure and your practice and what your normal looks like. Absolutely. I uh, have been in practice for three years. I'm in a group practice of, we were nine when I joined, but we're now seven with people retiring. And it's a very busy group practice in Memphis. Uh, I trained at, in Dallas and had my first child in residency as a, a chief resident. And she's now five. And I had my second child in my the middle of my second year of practice, right? Uh, actually, two months after I passed the boards. So I, w- I went to, I took the boards very, very pregnant. So, you know, I am at a different stage with my career and I probably have a lot to learn from you. But what I, the structure of my family is, is that my husband works, he works from home um, and we do have a full-time nanny. I couldn't make it work without her. 
Um, but I also have an incredibly um, understanding husband. And I think that finding a partner who is um, compatible with your goals is important. And that was, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to do that. I also was um, clear with my program director and my chairman that I wanted to have children and that I was eager to do so as a resident. So I was, I think the, either the first or the second female resident to have a baby in my program. And that required me to um, be very transparent with um, the leaders in my program and just tell them, you know, this is what was going on. And they were supportive, um, appreciated my candor and helped make it work for me and work for the program. And I think the more honest you can be as a resident, if you're trying to have children, um, the better it works out for you. And your, your professors appreciate that as, as do your co-residents. And I think that that's my biggest piece of advice I can offer about having a baby in residency is that you can do it, but you also kind of need to be prepared and plan ahead um, in terms of accruing time off and understanding what the rules are for the ACGME and the RRC to, to make it work for your life and your family. And what about your situation in Memphis? Did you move there to be closer to family? I, so I actually moved here to be closer to family and then, um, had a sudden family change and I'm actually taking care of my mom more than she's taking care of me. Hmm. So it's, it, things changed kind of very quickly. I thought I was moving home, um, so that my mom could help and that's not an option anymore. So, you know, I guess, you know, even when you move home, sometimes it doesn't work out the way that you expect it to. So I have found other resources, you know, I, there's sitter services that I've subscribed to, which I think are great 21st century answers for moms that work. I can, um, in addition to having a nanny, I have a couple subscriptions so that if at the drop of a hat, I'm on call and my husband needs to travel and my nanny's busy, I can, I can have backup. Or if, you know, my husband and I need to make time for each other and have a date night, we have ways to make that happen. COVID has obviously thrown a little bit of a wrench in all of those plans, but um, we still do take advantage of those things. And I think you just have to allocate your resources in ways that make your life work. And for us, um, it works to spend some money on those services and on our nanny to make our family a priority as both a married couple and also in our careers so that we can both have enjoyable careers. But I will say that my husband is more flexible than I am. And the reality is that if there's an emergency, he does have to bend faster than I do. And that that does put strain on your relationship to have to have one person who is the one who has to bend. And we have to be very candid with each other about how that makes us feel. And, you know, I have to learn to bend sometimes too. Tomorrow, my, my nanny actually has a medical issue and my husband's going to be out of town. So, um, I readjust, you know, I adjusted my schedule. I, by some grace of God, it, it worked, you know, so I'm going to be able to pick up my kid from school, which, you know, normally I can't do, but it works tomorrow. And so sometimes I do have to be the one that's flexible, but he undoubtedly is, is the one that the, the burden falls to more significantly than it does to me. And I think that's the case in, in many relationships. I think we'll probably hear that from others as well. How about you, Dr. Chaffin? Tell us about your career and your family situation. So I'm originally from the Detroit area. I did much of my training there and then came down to Tulane for the Plastics Fellowship. I graduated in 2008 and at that time was single, hadn't met my husband and met him three months into my first year in practice. He's a Louisiana boy with a Louisiana family here. And we got married the next spring. And at this point, you know, we're both 34 and we wanted to have children. So I didn't have any children in residency. And we got married and actually had our first child the following year when we were both 35, my daughter, who's now almost 11. And then we had twins when I was 36. And then I had another son when I was 38 and then a daughter when I was 40 and we thought we were done and gave away all the baby stuff. And then I have a COVID baby who is five months 
who you hopefully may or may not hear in the background a little bit because my poor husband is trying to get him to sleep right now. Um, so, you know, luckily, you know, my support system is here with my husband and his family. And what works for us is I have a wonderful mother-in-law who is our nanny three days a week and also is generally able to help with the drop of a hat if plans change. And then we have a family friend who has been our two day a week nanny for all 11 years and they work great together and can switch dates as necessary. So that's been a invaluable help. My husband's an attorney and he worked out of the home up until five years ago and then made a transition to working from home for a friend's law firm doing contract law uh, with an arrangement that he can take on as much or as little workload uh, as he likes in general, which has been really helpful during more stressful times uh, like the recent birth of our sixth child. Uh, so again, I agree with Carrie, you know, he definitely is the more flexible person. Him and his mother are getting my kids on the school bus in the morning. Luckily we have good public schools and they can get on the bus directly outside my house and it drops them back off. Uh, and that's really invaluable. You know, tonight they're here helping uh, so I can film this podcast. So I don't really think it would be possible without it. Um, so that's, that's the nuts and bolts uh, of what I do and how it works. And we do try to get time for date nights as well, uh, rely on some babysitter help on the weekends. Um, one of the other things is we have a, an, an RV uh, because, you know, traveling with six children, 10 and under via plane is something I don't ever want to attempt. So we have an RV for traveling for family vacations, which is traveling with your entire house on wheels, essentially, which makes it a lot more doable uh, when we do have time away. Great. That sounds like quite an adventure. Um, Dr. Black, you're in the unique situation of being in practice with your dad, correct? Um, so we'd love to hear about your multi-generational medical family. So I went to uh, LSU Medical School right across the street from where Abby was. And uh, we, I met my husband when I was a third year medical student. He was an intern and we got married when I was in general surgery residency. He was in neurosurgery residency at that time. We did not have children when we were in residency, mainly because there was only two residents and I was a little bit afraid of, you know, how that would impact the resident that was my counterpart for my year. And also I was still fairly young and I felt like I did have the luxury of time. So I waited until after I finished and then had my first child when I was 32 and then went on to have three more after that. Fortunately, I went into practice with my dad, who is also a plastic surgeon, and that was very helpful helpful for me in the regard that one of the things I was always concerned about was maternity leave and like, how do you handle all of that? It was nice to have a partner that was very supportive of those issues. Um, like everyone else on this call, I have a wonderful support team, and I think it would be very difficult to do this without the having some type of support system. My husband being a neurosurgeon, you know, he does as much as he can, but I, he's not the one that can be most flexible. Unfortunately, that falls on me. Um, and I don't think I could be as flexible if, as I am if it weren't for the work situation that I'm in knowing that my partner, who's my dad, you know, is very willing and able to help me in any way that he can. Fortunately, I haven't had to have that happen often, but it gives you a tremendous peace of mind to know that you can't, that you would have that if you needed it. Um, I have a lady that comes every day from seven in the morning until five o'clock. And usually she really comes probably half an hour early and stays an hour late. She's wonderful. She's, she's actually been with us since I was a resident. She was, she was the lady that cleaned our house when we were residents and we loved her so much. She's been with us ever since. And she's really a part, like a part of our family. So we, I've been very lucky to have her. And then my mother and father, both my father just helps in my practice, but my mother brings 
two of my kids to school every day. And so once your kids get bigger, those types of things like the bringing to school and the picking up and all of that is really kind of an important part of the juggling that occurs. For sure. Well, my personal situation was that I didn't get married until the end of my residency and we didn't have our first daughter until I'd been in practice for five years. And I was in academics at the time and I really felt like I needed to get my practice established before I had children. I had the thought that I might have more control over the schedule if I was already established by the time I took a little bit of time off. Um, and I think I was right about that. It was easier for me at, you know, five years in to, to you know, just say, look, I'm going to take time to pump. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to, you know, I've got to leave at X and so time. Um, but I did take a risk having them when I was 37 and almost 41, but I was lucky and I didn't have any fertility problems and I had two healthy babies. Um, so Dr. Campbell, you made the decision to have your children significantly earlier than that. And can you tell us a little bit about, um, was that a conscious choice for you and how much planning did you have to put into, um, the timing of that? It was a conscious choice. My husband and I got married when I was first or at the end of my first year residency. And so I, we had been married four years and I, we really were eager to start a family. I was in a program that had six residents a year. So I was also um, in a unique situation. I don't think I would have felt comfortable probably if I agree, if it had been myself and one other resident, that would have been difficult. But I sort of alluded to it earlier. I had to tell my program director ahead of time before I even started trying to have a baby that I was going to try to have a baby. Um, and, and I told my co-residents the same thing and they were all incredibly supportive. And as a result, they, my co-residents and my program director let me pick my chief year schedule based on when I got pregnant uh, so that I could deliver during my research block. And that's what I mean about if I hadn't been transparent, I'm not sure that I would, it would have worked so well. So that's why I encourage people to do so. Since I had my child, there's been multiple female residents that have had children and there's kind of a precedent that's been set and they make it work so that, you know, if they have to flip rotations and things like that, they make it work for the residents. But I, I recognize that that is unique in a larger program. So I, I recognize that it was a unique situation. I also, you know, I kind of had the opposite view of you in terms of when I wanted to have children because I felt like at the beginning of my practice, which granted I joined a great group and, um, but they were understanding of, you know, I wasn't that busy yet. So, I mean, I, I covered my calls. Um, I was given a maternity leave. I was salaried at the beginning of my practice. So in some capacity, it was a great time to have a baby right at the beginning because I didn't have packed clinics. I didn't, you know, I had a busy surgery schedule, but I could also say, okay, I'm going to stop operating now. And I told the breast surgeons, I told all my referrals that this is, you know, this is when I'm having a baby. I won't be able to see, you know, patients after this time, but you know, I have six or seven partners who are happy to take care of the patients as well. And who took care of my patients while I was out. So, um, I'm no longer, I'm, you know, the way our group is set up, I'm now, um, in a productivity model. So taking time off was actually harder for me now than it would have been when I was an employed member of the group. So that was sort of why, I mean, it, my group actually, I was not penalized in any capacity for taking that time off, which I think speaks to also joining the right group. I, I had two job offers and I thought that this one was a significant, Aside from being back with my family, it was also a significantly more collegial group of people. And that has been the best decision I've ever made was to join a group where I liked the people. Um, I'm making, may not be making as much money as I would have in the other group, but I don't know that it's significantly less, but the people are great. And um, it, would, it will be hard to ever consider leaving and going on on my own because we all kind of take care of each other, which is a unique situation. So, um, I have, I also joined a group where one of the senior partners who just retired this year was female. So that was, she had had children late 
and she was supportive of what I wanted to do. I also had another female partner that joined the year before me. So what had begun as an all male group with one woman was all of a sudden transformed into a 50, 50 female male group. And I think that helped as well to have other women around me to support, to support each other. So it was a conscious decision to, to have children early and, you know, I'm still figuring it out. Stay tuned. I'll, I'll let you know in 12 years when I'm where you all are, if it was a good decision, but, um, so far I'm, I'm really happy with when I decided to have kids. What about you, Dr. Chaffin, um, in terms of, um, your planning and how that has worked in your academic practice? Has that been different than a private practice model? How has that worked for you? Uh, well, sure. Well, again, I, I hadn't met my husband until I finished residency. I was three months out in my faculty position. So it really certainly wasn't planned. By, the, by, by that point, we were 34. And knowing that time is not necessarily on our side, we decided to try right away. Luckily, we, you know, we didn't have any fertility problems and that went well. Uh, initially, during my first maternity leave, and maybe that's a bonus with working in academics, uh, is I was able to negotiate with the surgery chair to have eight weeks uh, of leave, paid leave. Uh, it included my vacation time for that year. And that for me worked out well. I know some people would like to take longer. Um, and I had coverage from my partner for the first couple of my children. Uh, I think by the time I had my fourth child, I'm currently the only full-time employed plastic surgeon at my university. We do have, um, a, I have a part-time partner who covers a couple, eight calls a month and some of the microsurgery cases. So, you know, with, with this last baby, um, you know, I started bringing up with my chair, who's incredibly supportive, a female chair. She's been there five years, which I think is a huge reason that I'm able to make it work in academics is because she's exceedingly supportive of, you know, how was my maternity leave going to work? Uh, what about my referral sources? What about my post-ops? Who's going to cover my patients? So I have colleagues in private practice that are involved in the residency that are happy to take care of a complication but in terms of the hospital, even bringing this up to the chair, I said, well, what about the wounds that fall apart with neurosurgery or orthopedics? And what about the urgent cancer reconstructions with urology, with whoever, who's going to cover that? And she said, well, look, I'll go get with the hospital leadership and help figure that out. And the hospital leadership came back and said, it's okay. We'll just go on diversion for plastics for eight weeks. And then I said, well, wait a minute. Um, that's fine for many things that can wait, let's say breast reductions. But what exactly is your plan when the neurosurgeons, urologists, oncologists call with an urgent need that can't wait eight weeks? And I think they were still thinking they would go on diversion. So I said, well, maybe we could ask them, are they willing to have that conversation with each of the chairs of these departments that there will be zero coverage for complications or reconstructions for eight weeks and that their patients would have to be referred to outside competing institutions? Once I gently phrased it that way, they realized there was a problem and they were able to negotiate per diem call for several private plastic surgeons to cover the hospital consults for eight weeks. And um, so that, you know, that was, and there were situations that came up in the eight weeks and, you know, it wasn't something that I had to worry about. So that was huge. Um, I had eight weeks off with each of my children, uh, paid leave, you know, with benefits, uh, did affect my RVU somewhat, but it worked out pretty well in the end. And for me, that was the right time span to be off. <laughs> Quite frankly, I kind of wanted to go back earlier because it's crazy at my house. Um, but that, you know, that worked out well. And like I said, thankfully, a very supportive Department of Surgery chair who's really trying to create an appropriate culture uh, in our department and in the medical school, which is, I think, invaluable to feeling supported and being successful in academics. I've heard of other women in academic practices with RVU-based models having difficulty with that RVU-based model when they've taken eight or 12 weeks off for, um, for maternity leave. Do you feel comfortable speaking to, did that affect your um, uh, negotiated salary for the next year or your um, any, any um, bonus or um, productivity model that you might have been on? Sure, sure. Ours, ours is a bit of a hybrid situation of salary 
and RBUs, and that were uh, expected to really reach at least the 50th percentile average for an academic plastic surgeon in our region for RBUs, uh, and you know potentially rewarded at above the 75th percentile. So thankfully, with my FTE and the academic roles that I have that reduce the clinical FTE, I, I had my baby in April, and by March, I was well above, um, I think, almost the 200th percentile of RBUs. So I took three months off and still made a profit at the end of the year. So, you know, my chair's happy, I'm happy, and it worked out. Uh, that being said, you know, I knew I was above the limit, and so I didn't have to have that conversation. But if I was, and I was right at the line where two months off would put me below, I think that's something that you would want to have foresight about and ask the chair, is this something that there can be an RBU adjustment or a decrease in FTE so that I'm not penalized for taking time off or having to make up call or whatever it is. I think you have to be forthright and try to negotiate for those things and to find out what's been done in the past. Um, quite frankly, I approached my chair with this last maternity leave and she says, well, how much time do you want to take off? And I said, okay, well, what did the other two ladies that just had a baby do in the last couple of years? And I talked to them and they actually had taken 10 weeks off. And um, I said, well, I don't think I really needed that. Uh, maybe an extra week at the end for administrative stuff. Um, that being said, as the program director of the residency, there were a fair amount of meetings and emails that I did on leave by my choice, uh, but nothing too burdensome, maybe an hour a day, which worked out okay for me. Dr. Campbell, comment? Um, I think that's a really, it's a, I guess I didn't really comment on it, but when I said that I, wasn't penalized. I wasn't penalized by my group, but I do think that um, considering how much time you take off in private practice also does matter because I, I'm essentially, even though I was salaried, the, my ability to become uh, more productive was based on how much I made the first few years. And once I had to meet certain thresholds. So I was I did only take six weeks off because I didn't want to be, I didn't want to get underwater in terms of how, how productive I was for the group. But I will say that, and it was a conscious choice that I was okay with that by taking the time off to have a child, I probably delayed my partnership. Um, obviously not significantly as I've, you know, I'm three years in and I'm, I've, they've made me a partner, but I am, um, I did delay it probably about a half a year. Um, but that was a worthwhile trade-off in the long term. Yeah, you know, there's so many more women entering our field than when I was a resident in the 90s. Um, and with now residencies having about 40% women, um, the future of our, of our specialty is going to look really different. And all of these issues, whether it's in academia or private practice, are, are really going to come even more to the forefront. Um, we're really starting to see some traction with women in leadership positions and on the podiums at our meetings. Um, so there are going to be more women looking up to us to see how we did it and how did we make these negotiations. Dr. Black, what um, advice do you have for women entering surgical subspecialties who want to grow their family, especially during this time of overlapping maximum fertility um, plus early career? So I did mine a little differently than they did. I was I went directly into private practice and was and it was just so pretty much my salary was based on my production completely. I did not have a guarantee. I was completely production based. And I had a child about 12 months after I went into practice. The um so for me, for my first child, I took two weeks off and that was it. Um, the, the Then what I did was the next six months, I did part-time, which was really kind of a nice hybrid option in that what I did was I took off for six months. Fridays, I would only do a short surgery in the morning and then go home. So I was usually home by 10 o'clock and then... Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I work, but I usually left at about 3.30. So I kind of did a hybrid model. So I was still able to see all my post-ops, still keep people coming in for surgery or for Botox or fillers or whatever. So I could continue to grow my practice to some extent. And I still felt like I had a decent amount of time with the baby. 
because basically every weekend was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, a four day weekend. Um, and so I didn't, I felt like for me personally, considering that I was completely production based, it allowed me to still grow my practice, but still have a lot of time with the baby. And so I felt like that was a good option for me. Then for my subsequent kids, one of them I only took a week off. Um, so it was, but I had regular, I didn't have C-sections or anything like that. So, you know, I felt fine after just a couple of days and I already had childcare. So it kind of worked well to be able to just come and go as I, as, you know, as I wanted and how I, whatever suited me. So I felt like I was able to still, uh, you know, I still had to pay my overhead whether I was there or not. So if the baby was sleeping six hours a day, it, I felt like it was, you know, I would wake up, feed the baby, leave, go to work, come back, you know, it just kind of made it work for me. But I did not take very much time completely off. I took between one week and two weeks for all four kids. I'm not saying that everyone should do that. I'm just saying that's what I did. So let's switch back to the academic question again, Dr. Chaffin, you're in an academic department and you're teaching residents. And we know that academic departments of surgery are hemorrhaging talented women surgeons. Um, Usually what happens seems to be that after a few years in academia, they reject workplace environments that don't support them and aren't conducive to family life and they flock to private practice. And I, I don't think the problem is with the women, but rather with the system. So do you think that ship can right itself? And if so, what's the, what's the key? I think it can. And of course, I think it speaks to the culture of your institution and the leadership at your institution. You know, I never thought it was particularly bad at my institution, but a, a previous chair had told me at one point, you know, some people just stay assistant professors forever. So that doesn't seem quite right. And I didn't think I had a lot of you know, support with what the process was for promotion. You know, I, I did have a longer delay to promotion to associate professor, but potentially by choice. I wasn't traveling to as many meetings with new babies. I wasn't presenting at many things. And then when my current chair, a female chair took over in 2016, she really made it her mission to first change the culture, define our culture and be supportive, grow equity, diversity and inclusion, uh, have specific task force for this, um, try to you know, improve all of these things, which has made it a tremendous culture in our department, which I think is highly supportive, where I feel that it's appropriate to bring up issues that come up. And maybe it's never been addressed before, uh, but I think it will be, you know, fairly considered. So I think that's really important. How do we increase that? Well, we try to find ways to keep more women in academics so they become, become section chiefs. They can become chairs of departments and help grow the future generations. We need to do that step-by-step with uh, better mentoring, uh, better opportunities for advancement. I think women oftentimes, you know, doubt themselves. Uh, I'm not going to apply for that promotion because I only meet 99% of the criteria, not 100. And I don't think that's the case with men who, you know, well, I've been doing this a week. I think maybe I should be promoted. I'm going to put my name in the hat. And, you know, I think many times we're afraid of, of failure. Uh, so, you know, that I think we need to ask for more. Um, you need to be very aware at your institution what the criteria are for academic promotion and take any resources they may have to go over that. Uh, it's pretty transparent. It's on the internet and the things that you need, how many international meetings, how many national meetings, and really target that uh, and target to improve your CV. I think we need to network with advanced academic plastic surgeons around the country. How many are full professors? How many are associate professors? Could we assist each other in writing letters of promotion? I think it's going to take an entire sistership, uh, sisterhood to help further increase this and not hemorrhage women from academics. Uh, reconstructive surgery is fun. It's fun if you're in the right environment and you have you know, good supportive people around you. Well, thanks for those comments. And I think you're, you're spot on. So before we finish, let's move on to some practical tips for making career and family work. We know it can be done. So let's talk about those 
practical tips for how. Dr. Campbell, what are your biggest challenges and your best couple of tips for keeping your life running smoothly, both at the office and at home? The greatest thing that my working sister-in-law taught me was to, I have a contract with my nanny. And part of my contract is that I have date nights guaranteed. And so I, um, I would say, well, I'll get back to that other one, but so make sure that you make time for your family and do so intentionally, uh, whether that be your husband or your children. And so at, at the beginning of every three months, when the call schedule comes out, I pick the weekends that I know that we can most definitely get away and I put it on her calendar and she knows it three months in advance. And so that's scheduled. Number two is to some, sometimes volunteering for things gives you more control and that makes your life easier. So I volunteered to make the call schedule for my group, um, which is a, a pain, a pain to do, but it gives me control over my life. And so every three months it's annoying for a day. And then it's great for the next three months that I made sure that my children's um, needs and my husband's needs and my needs are um, possibilities. A shared family calendar is essential and my nanny's on it. My husband's on it and I'm on it. And we put everything on it so that we know, you know, when I'm, my call schedule's on it. So all of that is available for everyone to see. And that makes life a lot easier. What calendar Um, do you use? Um, We just use like an Apple calendar that we share. And then I actually print out that week and put it on the fridge for everyone to be able to see. I have someone that comes and cleans my house. Um, I couldn't live without it. I, it's not my forte, nor is it how I want to spend my time. So um, that is a worthwhile expense for me. And I, I make every uh, two Wednesday mornings, a month. I make sure that I can um, go with my daughter to school. They have a special time on Wednesday mornings. I make, I carve it out on my calendar. Um, and as soon as the school calendar comes out, I put it on my, um, my operative schedule for the whole calendar year so that I know if my, I, I make it intentional that if my daughter is out of school, I try and take that day off, which doesn't always work, but it, when it does, it's awesome. And she really appreciates it. Dr. Chaffin, biggest challenge and best tip? Um, I think the the biggest challenge is just the daily juggle, you know, and having a lot of help in making it happen. You know, Monday night is soccer night for this child, and I'm not going to be there. I am going to be there and helping, you know, to get generally his mom staying late to help, which is a huge blessing. Um you know, we also have a shared list and like the Alexa list for groceries. We have a rule if somebody stops to get one thing at the grocery store, you have to check the list and get the four or five things that have piled on there since yesterday. Um, we somewhat have to lower our standards. We eat a lot of the same simple foods um, every night. Pizza night is every Friday because we're just too tired to cook. And, um, you know, to keep it really simple, each child gets one activity, not four. And we try to group them if they're on the same night in the same location if possible. You know, sometimes these things change. But, you know, having a lot of help, keeping lists, keeping organized, keeping things very, very simple um, helps the most. And Dr. Black, you've been in practice for 16 or 17 years now. Um, And looking back, what are your best tips for making it work with four kids and a thriving cosmetic practice? So what I would say is, as women, I think we all focus a lot on like the maternity leave that you take when you have a new baby. But honestly, that's probably more for you than for the baby. The real thing is like what Abby said, and that is the day-to-day stuff. You know, just figuring out how you can be available to do the things that that you really, like I actually enjoy bringing my kids to school and picking them up from school and doing those things. And so for me, that was important. And it's it's really figuring out in your mind how you can make be available for the things that you think are important for you and your children and and somehow make those work with your schedule. So for me, I like bringing my kids to school. Every single day, I bring a couple of kids to school. Maybe it's not the same kids every day. We rotate and it's different every year depending on who's going to what school and what grade they're in. But that's something I enjoy. So I don't do seven... 
I'll do a seven o'clock case, you know, once a month when that's the only time they can give me. But for the most part, my OR schedule starts at eight or eight thirty. So I can drop my kids off and then go to school. And I try and then when and there were times in my career, particularly when my children were younger, um, like there was a whole year that I picked up two of my kids from school every single day for the whole year. That meant I had to finish clinic every single day at three o'clock. And I didn't do it for a long period of time. It was just a year, but my kids still talk about that. Like how I picked them up from school every day for a year. So they loved it and I loved it. And so I just, I try to be flexible in those things. It wasn't something I could continue doing forever because you can't go your whole life and leave clinic at three o'clock if you want to have a practice. But I tried to, I I just kind of, you got to be flexible over time. Like your needs this year are going to be different than your needs next year. Needs for a toddler are different than needs for, a, you know, a kid that's in grammar school or middle school. And, you know, right now my kids are in middle school and high school. So picking them up is time that I have with them in the car where they actually will talk to you. Mm-hmm. And they're, whereas when they were two or three or four, I enjoyed bringing them to school more than picking them up because that was when they would talk to you. So you kind of have to just be flexible and make your schedule schedule flexible to the needs that of your family. And so that's what I've tried to do. And also, like, I think everyone here would agree, having a SWAT team of help is really important, whether it's family or trusted babysitters or nannies. Having people that you trust to take good care of your children and love them and go into work and knowing that your children are safe is, in my opinion, very important. So, you know, we've, that's, that's pretty much the way I feel like I've been able to manage it for this amount of time. And the other thing is, Abby brought this up, and I think it's important, and I think it's true. Some of the choices you make will will negatively impact your salary. But for me, when those things have happened, and it's happened several times throughout the years because I've had four children, I've never regretted it. I never minded taking a pay cut to some extent at certain periods, like the year that I picked my kids up every day at three o'clock, my salary was lower that year, but I felt like it was worth it. And so it was a choice that I made, but but it was a choice that I would make again. And so I kind of feel like this is time that you'll never get back. And so it didn't hurt my practice long-term. It may have hurt it for that year, but you have to make a decision like what things are important and be willing to accept that you may take a pay cut for a short period of time, but realize that it's not in the long run. I think for most people, it won't negatively impact them long term. Great. I think that's great insight. And I'm glad that we've had input from three surgeon moms with different ages of children as well, because I think that that really makes a difference. I totally agree with you that when you get them in the car, when they're teenagers, that's when they actually still talk to you. And 10 o'clock at night is what happens in my house. Um, Just as I'm trying to go to bed and somebody decides they want to talk to me. Well, thanks again so much to our guests, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Chaffin, Dr. Black. You've reminded us that it's absolutely possible to grow your practice and your family. And you've given our listeners some tips that you've learned along the way as you've been growing your families and successful practices. I wish you all the best. And thanks again for your honesty and sharing your stories with us today. Thanks everyone for tuning in to our Allergan Limitless Leaders podcast. Please subscribe to hear more from this exciting series and initiative. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Limitless Leaders podcast series brought to you by ASPS, the Aesthetic Society, and the American Hernia Society with the generous support of Allergan Aesthetics. Check out additional episodes on your favorite podcast platform or download directly from ASPS Ednet. New seasons and episodes are coming soon. We look forward to seeing you there.